nanohub.org. Um, so in the last uh, half an hour or so of the class, we'll talk about one last important analytical result uh, I wanted to cover in the class, which is the notion of peak interaction forces, uh, which again, the key point is, is the tip interacts with the sample. Uh, it's a pulse. Interaction force is a pulse. You want to know what the maximum force is. Because the reason is because the average, you might think you're applying one nanonewton of average forces, but if the peak forces are more than 10 nanonewtons, then as we discussed, you might be applying a gigapascal of normal stress on the surface. So uh, it's very important, therefore, to understand what is the peak interaction force as well. Now, keep in mind, the peak interaction forces must now depend on the local properties of the surface. The average force doesn't, but the peak force value should. On a harder sample, you should expect higher forces. Softer sample, you should ex expect softer forces, okay? How do we deal with that? Um, so um, this is a very important quantity that is not observed in AFM because in an AFM, what you observe is the initial amplitude, which you know this in millivolts or nanometers. You know what the set point amplitude is. You know what the phase lag is as you scan a sample. Uh, you know energy dissipation in uh, using phase lag. You know the vario and you know the average FTS. These are all things you can get numbers for, right? Simply based on phase and average forces. What you know also as parameters are the equivalent stiffness K, natural frequency, Q factor, all these things you know. What we do not know when you do tapping mode AFM are what are called non-observables. We actually do not know this little history of tip sample interaction force as it's tapping dynamically on the sample. We don't observe it. Uh, we also don't know what the peak force is. We also don't know what the minimum force is. So there's, you know, the interaction force is like a, like a pulse like that. The minimum value gives you the adhesion. Maximum gives you the peak force, right? But you're doing it dynamically at the resonance. So this is complicated. You, d you do not observe everything on the right, okay? Everything on the left, either you know or you observe in an experiment. So the big challenge in AFM for the very long time was how do you take everything on the left-hand side and predict somehow what's on the right-hand side. If you can do this, uh, you are able to therefore um, map in tapping mode and get quantitative numbers for adhesion or elastic modulus when you're tapping, which is an extremely difficult thing to do. I don't think anyone has been able to do it uh, to date. But nonetheless, it's interesting in theory to at least try to understand what is the relation between the peak interaction force and these observables, okay? So I won't go into too much detail, but um, you know we do need to know what is the peak interaction force and what does it depend on? Uh, how does it depend on local properties? If you're tapping on a sample, if a part of a sample has a modulus that's 10 times more than another part, do you expect the interaction force on the stiffer part to be 10 times greater? So does it scale with elastic modulus? And let's say you're applying too much force and you're destroying the sample. Uh, you want to change the cantilever. So if you choose a cantilever with a stiffness that's one-tenth, does that reduce the interaction force, peak interaction force by one-tenth? Or what's the scaling laws? Is there some sort of similitude that tells us if you double the stiffness, half the stiffness, double the elastic modulus of the sample, how does this peak interaction force change by? This is a very important quantity, peak interaction force. In fact, there's the latest mode of operation that Vico has produced. It's called, in fact, it's called peak force AFM. It's a mode of AFM that controls what is the maximum, this peak interaction force that you get over the sample. So it's so important in the AFM community, this, this, this number. Okay? So how do we know what are the peak forces? Well, one way to do it is to do simulations, okay? Uh, and when you do simulations, you have to choose an interaction force. Uh, here's a typical um, uh, interaction force that you've studied. It's a DMT interaction model, where there's a Van der Waals component shown uh, in green. At a certain critical distance, you start getting repulsive interactions and you move up, okay? So you've done this before. But you can also have other models like what's called a linear sample stiffness model. You know, what you can say is that uh, there's no interaction until you hit the sample, and the sample is like a spring, just like a spring, and you want to know some spring constant of the spring, for example. Now, when you have an attractive and repulsive regime, I hope uh, it's been made clear now 
that when you plot the history of the interaction forces as a function of time, uh, you can have two different situations. You can have a situation like shown below, where the interaction force is negative most of the time. So it comes, it feels Van der Waals forces moves away. So the interaction force is negative, becomes more negative, and then moves away. So you get an inverted tent. That would imply only Van der Waals forces. It just comes in, close, and moves away. Right? And the average value then becomes negative. Therefore, you have a net attractive regime. Or you could have a, a situation where you're literally tra tapping on the sample, where you first experience attractive forces shown in green, but you, you penetrate enough that you tap the sample and you get repulsive interactions in red and move away, right? So at the bottom of this oscillation cycle, you're going to get either uh, interaction force history shown by the green below or by the green and red above, right? Depending on if you're in the attractive or repulsive regimes of operation. So what we want to do now is to try and estimate uh, what is the FTS peak, which is in the repulsive regime of operation, what's the highest value of force you apply on the sample. And when you're in the attractive regime, we want to know what is the lowest or, or the most attractive force that's applied to the sample. Attractive forces are also important because if you have attractive forces, the surface of the object is actually being pulled up because there's a net attractive force in the tip in the sample. So if you, I, have, I don't think anyone's measured this, but in principle I would say that when you're in the attractive regime, the height of a soft object should appear higher than what it really is because it's like a, you know, you have, it's like a, it's, you're pulling the surface up because of attractive forces. Whereas in a net repulsive regime you're pressing, the height should be lower than what it ought to be. Okay. So how do we deal with this? Uh, so let me give you an idea of how this works. Uh, what is plotted here is a simulation done for in beta for the parameters shown on the top. You have a spring constant of 1 Newton per meter. Q is 50. You're tapping DMT contact model on a polymer sample, 1 gigapascal. Tip radius is 10 nanometers and so on. Tip, you know, initial amplitude is 25 nanometers. What's plotted here is in this simulation, what is the history of tip sample interaction force, in this case, as a function of Z? So as you bring this oscillating cantilever close to the surface, what happens to the interaction force? So what's the history? So if you focus on this part here first and you zoom in, you get this train of pulses that are the inverted tents like I showed because you're in the attractive regime. Initially, as you approach, you come close, there's an attractive force, and you pull away, and so you get this inverted pulses. So we call this F attractive peak. So what's the peak attractive force? That's what it means, right? What's the most negative this interaction force goes? We call it peak attractive force. As you come close, at a certain point here, there's a transition, and suddenly you start getting repulsive interactions also. This is a jump from attractive to repulsive. Here you have only attractive, and then at a certain point out here, you suddenly have repulsive interactions. If you take a slice here, look at it, the interaction force history is as shown on the top right. There's a little attractive part, but then it switches and you have this big pulse, which means it's going through the attractive repulsive range and back all the way through. The highest value there is going to be F repulsive peak. Right? This is a very interesting curve because as you move from the right to the left, you're approaching the sample, right? So on the far right, you're far from a sample and you're coming close to the sample here. What is happening to the peak force during the process? What you notice is when you're far from a sample, there are no interaction forces, right? So no forces. When you first come, you find that the attractive force, peak attractive force increases. There's a transition to repulsive, but the repulsive forces don't keep increasing as you reduce the amplitude. They go up to a certain value and they go down. Very interesting. What this suggests is what we ought to see is when, when you do this tapping mode experiment, you can reduce the peak forces either by staying at large set point amplitudes or by coming much closer to the sample out here, really reduce the amplitude a lot. So either if you want to keep forces low, you want to be up there, or you want to be down here. So the question then is, you know, is there a simple expression that tells us the shape of this bell-shaped, you know, which tells us what set-point amplitude we need to use to reduce peak imaging forces and so on. So um, 
I won't uh, show you uh, too much detail. I do want to point out one important uh, thing. Uh, this is a uh, simulation done in beta with the parameters um, shown on top. On the x-axis, I've shown the set point ratio. So all of you know what the set point radio ratio is. is simply uh, what is the amplitude you choose to operate divided by the free amplitude before interaction. That's it. Okay. Uh, as a function, what's plotted on the top with the VEDA simulation is what the average interaction of the force is as a function of set point ratio. What's plotted at the bottom is what the peak value of the interaction force is. What I want to show is that the shapes are completely different. The average force tends to keep increasing as you press down further and further. It keeps increasing as you reduce the amplitude. The average force keeps going up. It bends down a little at the very bottom. For, for the most part, the average force keeps decreasing. The peak force, on the other hand, goes up to a certain value. And this is about 50 to 60 percent set point, And then it goes down after that. The other important thing is the peak force, if you look at the values, are about an order of magnitude larger than the average force. That's the other important reason you need to have some idea of what the peak forces are, because they're much larger than the average force. Okay, so uh, there are a couple of references I have for you at the bottom, which tell you uh, how to derive these expressions analytically, but there are some very nice expressions, like on the top, for example, that tell you what is the value of the peak interaction force F in terms of the elastic modulus of the sample, in terms of the cantilever constant, uh, spring constant, in terms of Q factor, in terms of the free amplitude, and in terms of the A ratio. A ratio is, again, chosen amplitude divided by free amplitude. You choose your set point ratio, 0 0.8, 0 0.6, 0 0.5. So the details are given in these papers, but now you start seeing some very interesting results. It, this suggests that uh, if you are tapping on a part of the sample where the elastic modulus is, let's say, E star is 10 gigapascal, and then you tap on us on the same scan, you've got another part of the sample that's one gigapascal. What it suggests is that the peak force on the harder part of the sample is not 10 times larger than on the softer part of the sample, but rather the peak force scales as e to the one, one quarter, 0.25. So if part of the sample has a modulus that's 10 times greater, it doesn't mean the peak force is going to be 10 times greater. It's going to be very little. Not, it is going to be larger, but not by a lot. Okay? That's what it means. It also shows that the best way to reduce the peak interaction forces is to keep the initial amplitude as small as possible, A0. That multiplies the whole expression. So if you keep your initial amplitude as small as possible, you are ensuring that you apply very gentle forces during tapping mode imaging. Uh, the other way to look at it is A ratio. This expression is very interesting because it says that you can either choose A ratio close to 1. That means that you're choosing to image with an amplitude that's very close to the free amplitude. So, you know, you're just beginning to interact with the samples. So the amplitude just reduced a little bit, right? That, so that the A ratio is close to 1, 0.9 or 1. If you do that, you find that the overall, this, this term, last term, is, becomes very small again. You can also choose to do it at a situation where you reduce the A ratio to closer to zero. So really press closer to the sample, right? And so you bring A ratio close to 0.1 or 0.2. Make this small. That's another way to reduce the whole thing. So it's interesting. It, this tells us you got to keep small free amplitudes, as small as you can. And you either want to choose large amplitude ratios or low amplitude ratios to reduce interaction forces. The worst thing you can do is to have an amplitude ratio of about 50 to 60 percent. This is the worst. You apply the maximum most. You're really hammering at that point, the sample. Okay? It's a very important result in that point, in, in that sense. All right? So this, for example, is uh, plotting non-dimensional peak interaction force versus set point ratio for many different parameters, and you find that, again, that the maximum peak forces occur at set points between 50 and 60 percent. So if you really want, in tapping mode, to indent the sample as much as possible, you want to choose to image between 50 and 60 percent set point. Now, 
for the most part, we don't want to apply large forces to the sample, but there are situations where you do want to apply large forces to the sample. Uh, for example, if you're trying to do phase contrast imaging of polymers, uh, the more you indent, the more you're sampling viscoelastic forces, the more contrast in properties you're going to get. So in fact, it has been shown that phase contrast and tapping mode on two component polymer systems is maximized when you choose set point amplitudes between 50 and 60 percent because you're indenting the most, you're applying the most forces. So it, it's, it's like a compromise. You don't want to apply too much forces to destroy the sample. At the same time, if you want to see mechanical property contrast, you have to, you have to exercise the material a little bit, right? You have to push against it a little bit, otherwise you can't get a good contrast. And so it's a very well-known fact that for in-air, for polymer systems, you're looking at set points between 50 and 60% to maximize phase contrast as well, okay? Um, and there are a few other uh, results. So the, the nice thing about this analytical theory is that, you know, for different interaction forces, you can actually come up with these closed form analytical solutions for peak forces and so on. And it gives you a very good idea. I mean, if you did not do this, you wouldn't know how these interaction forces scale with local properties and what you need to do to reduce or increase the forces. Without that, without having this theory, you are trying to play around with a vast degree of operating parameters. You don't know what free amplitudes, you don't know what set points, you don't know what cantilevers, you don't know how it depends on samples. If you don't have these expressions, you're really trying to optimize in a very large dimensional space all your parameters. And this really helps focus you. These are the key things. You don't need to worry about, um, you know, the elastic modulus of the sample too much. You need to, first of all, worry about low amplitudes, high or low set point ratios to reduce imaging forces, okay? So uh, a good example, a good practical example of this is shown here. And by the way, the more AFM you do, the more examples you'll see where this happens, okay? You will find, for some samples, some cantilevers work, others don't work. Guaranteed, the more you spend time they're going to be these magical cantilever choices which you will stick to for the rest of your life because you know they work for you. Always happens, right? Everybody, you have your favorite cantilevers for, for some reason, and you try to objectively defend your choice of cantilever, and you can never objectively do it. At the end of the day, it's always, it's because I've used this cantilever for the, for the last five years, and this is what works. I've tried the other one, it doesn't work. Nobody knows why, nobody knows. This is how it works, right? So here's an example of a situation that was brought to our notice by our collaborators in Spain. Uh, they were dealing with liquid uh, imaging of biological samples. And uh, for the longest time, they've been using two kinds of cantilevers. They've been using uh, what we would call the conventional cantilevers shown on the right, which are 200 microns long. They're pretty soft. They have a tip height of 2.9 micrometers. You see that? This is the SEM image on the right. On the left is uh, a, uh, a cantilever that people really, who, people who do biology really love. It's produced by Olympus. It's called the BioLever. They just absolutely, the people who will swear by it. Again, everyone offers different reason why it works. But, you know, it's a very short cantilever, very thin cantilever. And you look at the tip height as seven microns, okay? And using this, uh, our collaborators, they're trying to image uh, viruses, virus particles in liquid solution. They guarantee us that you play around as much as you like, but at the end of the day, the bilever is able to nicely reproducibly image these very soft um, balloon-like things that, you know, whereas you try to use a conventional lever and you always squish it and compress it so you don't really see this very well. The height of this virus is supposed to be 50 nanometers you image with the um, uh, large lever, and the height is 3.5 nanometers. You're basically, it's an empty balloon you're imaging, so you basically collapsed the balloon. You applied beyond a certain threshold amount of force and just flattened it. And they told us that, look, for the life, I mean, they, they've tried this so many times, there's no way, is this cantilever works, that doesn't work. And so then you sit and ask the question, why? And they do this not only with uh, viruses, but also with 
uh, micro uh, tubules, and it's very similar. I mean, they just get conventional lever just seems to flatten these things, where the small levers seem to improve things. And if you look at the possibilities of what the difference between the two levers are, there are many things. I'll tell you, for every person who asks this question, they'll provide you a different reason for why one works, why doesn't, why one doesn't work. Many reasons. Someone will say, oh, it's a smaller lever, there's less hydrodynamic drag. Another one will say, oh, it's a thinner lever, so the mass is smaller. Another one will say, you know, all kinds of reasons come, come up because, but if you think about it, uh, the really interesting thing is, if you compare the cantilever stiffness of the two, they're comparable. That's the third, third row from the bottom. Right? They're, they're soft cantilever. These are 0 0.06 Newton per meter. Uh, those of you who do AFM imaging in air will ne won't even imagine stiffnesses that are as soft as this, but for biology, you need them. So really, it's a big question is, you know, the stiffness is the same. Um, Q factors, when you're far from a sample, are similar, 1.84, 1.85 Q factors. So what's, what's the difference between these two? Why does one work, one doesn't work? Some people will say, oh, the tip length is longer, tip length is bigger, all kinds of things. So this is one of those situations where having simple formulas helps us provide one possible reason for this. And so one of the uh, key things here was to uh, understand the following fact. So when you're doing your liquids, it turns out on viruses that you don't need to have this DMT interaction model because the Van der Waals forces are screened also in liquids. Turns out a good enough model is no force, and when you touch the sample, you get a spring constant K. It's like a spring. That's a, in a good enough interaction. So using the same theory that I showed you, this is the expression of peak interaction force you get when you have a spring, when you have the sample modeled as a spring with a spring constant KTS, okay? And you get a very similar expression in terms of free amplitude and set point ratios. What I want to bring to your attention is this K of the cantilever divided by Q is an important quantity here, okay? Now, here's what was noticed in this particular case, that if you go to air, uh, so, so let's first look at the cantilever on the top. This is the small Olympus bilever. In air, if you plot what the resonance of the cantilever looks like, it's shown in black. So the resonance frequency in air is about 45 kilohertz, okay? And it has a high Q. When it's put in water, on the other hand, um, it shifts to the blue, which means, the reason is because when you put a cantilever in water, its effective mass increases a lot because not only is it oscillating, it's moving a huge amount of hydrodynamic mass with it. And so if you think the resonance frequency is spring constant divided by mass, now the mass has become much larger. It's massive because it's trying to drag the hydro hydrodynamic uh, motion with it. So the frequency decreases and there's more viscosity so the Q factor reduces, okay? So when you're in liquid far from a sample, the Q factor is about 1.85, but one more important thing happens in liquids is you do tuning far from a sample, you get a certain Q value, but when you come close to the sample and try to do this, like when you're at imaging distance from the sample, the Q decreases even more. And all this has to do with hydrodynamics. You've got cantilever now in a viscous medium. You've got a wall, the sample. You're trying to oscillate close to a wall. There's more drag. What was found is that when you're tuned far from a sample, you get the blue curve. But when you come close to the sample, you get the red curve, which means the Q decreases even further to 1.02 when you're imaging the sample. So Q really goes down when you bring it close to the sample. Now, you look at the conventional lever. When you're liquid far from a sample, you've got the blue curve, okay? And the Q factor is 1.85. So when you're far from a sample and you do the tuning on the conventional, the Q is very similar to what you get in the biolever. But when you come close to the sample and measure the Q, the Q, you get a red curve. You don't get any peak. And in, in damping, it's what we call, it's become overdamped. I think I talked to you about overdamped. When the damping becomes so high, you don't even get any resonance peak anymore. In fact, the Q factor became 0.47 already. So it's completely overdamped. You don't even get a peak. What frequency are you going to choose with the red curve here at the bottom? Nothing. It's, it's gone. It's just damped out. So, um, so the conclusion here was the following, was that um, the K is pretty similar in these two conventional versus uh, you know other cantilevers. But the Q, when you're close to the sample, is different by a factor of two or three. 
The Q, in the case of the uh, bilever, turned out to be much larger than uh, for the conventional lever when you bring it close to the sample. When you're far from a sample and tuning curve, it's very similar. And this was a very important thing. What it does is it changes the value of the peak repulsive force by nearly all things else being the same, same free amplitude, same set point. You're applying nearly twice larger forces with the conventional lever as compared to the bio lever because the Q near the surface is nearly different by a factor of three. And you take the two-thirds power into account, it works out to nearly, you're applying 100% larger forces for the same imaging conditions here. Uh, and it turns out that viral capsids are, I mean, you might wonder, you know, double the force may not be such a big thing, but it depends. For a lot of biological samples, like for a virus or for microtubules, uh, they have a threshold of a force at which the buckle and collapse. So they're not like, they're not like materials where you apply a one nanonewton force, they press down a little, two nanonewton, they press more, three nanonewton, you know, it's not incremental. What ends up happening with viral capsids and with microtubules is, you reach a certain value and then buckles, the whole thing collapses. And that tends to happen at about one nanonewtons for these things. So, uh, you know, same imaging conditions, but the conventional lever applying double large, double amount of forces makes a big difference for these kind of samples, okay? So, um, with that, I'd like to end the class and uh, point out that we have sort of concluded with the, what we can say analytically in tapping mode AFM, we've got many key results. Um, what we start talking about next time is this notion that when you're scanning in tapping mode, how do you adjust the feedback control? We're going to talk a little bit about feedback control because when you scan, you've got proportional integral controls. How do you deal with it? How do you choose them? Uh, what effect do they have on the imaging stability? So we'll talk about, so we're going to talk a little about controls now. We've been, we've done the gamut, right? We've gone from surface physics to mechanics. Now we're going to do some controls. Uh, uh, you need to know all this for AFM, so thank you.